Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, the scripture text is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, and I'm going to be reading verses 11 through 17. And this is what it says. It says, Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. Pray with me. Lord, that, that this day, word of you might spread, might spread, because that's the word that this, this world needs to hear, the word of you. What you've done, your compassion, your power, Lord, may, be, may we be just the, the ones to spread it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning the story starts out with a, a large crowd was following Jesus and his disciples. They were in the southern part of Galilee and they were getting ready to go into the town of Nain. Jesus, his disciples, and a large crowd well, whenever the Gospels use that word large crowd, that's what was said when Jesus fed the 5,000. Well, were there 5,000 people following him around the southern part of Galilee? Don't know. Could have been like the 4,000. A large crowd. It might have been a crowd of 4,000 or a crowd of 100. We don't know how large. But what we do know from the story is as Jesus and his disciples and the large crowd were going into the town of Nain, there was a large crowd coming out of Nain. Well, this large crowd was a little different. It was a funeral procession. They must have had their, their lights on and the, the little funeral hanging from, uh, signs hanging from their rearview mirrors. And so Jesus and his disciples and his large crowd did what large crowds are supposed to do when there's a funeral procession. They pulled over and they, they waited for them to come by. And then the miraculous happened. Strange thing, very unusual thing, something that you just never do see. Now, I've seen a lot of strange things in funeral processions. I've been a part of some strange things that have happened in funeral processions. I remember one time... I was in Rome, Georgia. The funeral was over, and we were making our way to the cemetery. Well, I had never been to this cemetery. Uh, I didn't know where it was. Luckily, I wasn't in the very front. I was more like the middle. There were about 10 or 15 cars behind me, and I was just following the, the car in front of me. And I knew I'd get there as long as I followed the car in front of me. That's when, in the distance, I heard a train whistle. 
Then my imagination started running. I began to think, well, you know what in the world would happen if a train came in the middle of a funeral procession, just cut it out, the train's not going to pull over, the train's not going to stop. And I wondered, well, what would happen if a train came in the middle of a funeral procession? Well, I was about to find out. The gate came down right in front of me. And as I saw the the car in front of me make its way down the road, I was wondering, well, what are they going to do? Are they going to leave someone back there? Are they going to leave a message, direction, something that will tell me where the, the cemetery is? Because I have 10 or 15 cars behind me. And every time the, a train car passed, I tried to look between the cars to see what happened to the procession. By the time the train passed, nothing but wide open spaces on the other side of the tracks. Well, men, you'll be glad to know I did not stop and I did not ask directions. I wasn't about to turn in my man card that day. I did what men do. I bluffed. I went to the only cemetery that I knew of in Rome, Georgia, and I drove just like I knew exactly what I was doing. And as I drove up, the, the front part of the procession was pulling into the cemetery right ahead of us. Now tell me there's no God. <laughs> Sometimes He just shouts to you. Sometimes it's just so obvious that there's no denying it. And the story we read this morning, this is one of those times. This is one of those times where God screams out, but it's not in quite the way that we expect. We do a cursory reading of it and go, well, the miracle there is Jesus raised a a man dead. Absolutely. That's the most obvious, but, but the gospel writer doesn't want us to miss the other miracle that happened that day. That in verse 13, it says that Jesus had compassion for her. He said, do not weep. Then he placed his hand on the coffin and said, rise. And the young man rose and began to speak. That Jesus had compassion for her. That was unheard of among the pagan gods. Jesus had compassion for her. We've seen that before in the, in, in the gospel writing. When blind Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus, he had compassion for him and he restored his sight. When the ten lepers called out to Jesus, he saw their leprosy and he had compassion for them and he healed them. When the woman with the issue of blood began to to tug at Jesus' robe, he noticed her. He had compassion for her and he healed her. But this is before anyone cries out. This is before anyone calls out. This is before anyone tugs that Jesus sees and he notices. That the gospel writer wants to make sure that you and I don't miss it. That our God is is a God of compassion. That he's a good and loving God and his compassion is seen through his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's nature. That we can know the character of God by, by, by reading, by seeing, by hearing the character of Jesus. And our God is a God of compassion. This morning... It may be that you're in that hard place and you feel like you're all alone. This morning, it may be that you're in that difficult place and and you feel like God doesn't notice. This morning, those may be your feelings, but I've come to tell you the truth and the truth has a name. It's Jesus Christ. And the truth is, That God knows, He notices, and He cares that you matter to God. You matter to God. That His compassion is poured out before you call, before you cry out, before you tug. So rise up. This is a message of hope. Rise up. Rise up this morning and trust Him. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. Rise up and trust Him. Terry Anderson was Middle East correspondent for the Associated Press back in 1985. 
He was stationed in Beirut, and he was coming off tennis court. When he came off the tennis court, a group of men came behind him. They put a sack over his head, pushed him into a car. He had just been kidnapped by the terrorist group Hezbollah. They held him captive for six years and nine months. Almost seven years, Terry Anderson was held captive. And it, when he was let loose, he was being interviewed. And in the interview, a newspaper man asked him, said, Terry, did you ever lose hope? And this is what he said. I want to share it with you this morning. He said, well, you know, that's a hard question. Of course, I had some blue moments, moments of despair. But fortunately, right after I became a hostage... One of the first things that fell into my hands was a Bible. Over the last six and a half years as a captive, I've spent a lot of time with the Bible. And that helped me so much because it's about hope. It's about trust in God. And that's what gave me the strength to make it through each day. Faith helps you do what you have to do. I spent a lot of time with the Bible, and it reminded me to do the best I could each day and to trust God for the future. Jesus Christ shows that our God is a good and loving God, a compassionate God. He notices, He cares that you matter to God. So often our culture tries to tell us that, that God is distant, that He's the man upstairs that he's sort of like the divine watchmaker. He's just sort of kind of got things started and that we're on our own. And when we begin to believe that we're on our own, there are only about two ways of responding. One is we try and take over ourselves. And we begin to manage and control, cajole and push and persuade the people around us because we're the only ones that are in control. The only other way to respond to, to a God that's, that's distant is despair. The miracle, the miracle of the risen Christ is that, that we're not alone, that He's right here this day that the risen Christ, that is as close as your very own breath. And His message is a message of hope. Rise up. Rise up and trust Him. Rise up and trust Him. But not only rise up and trust Him, rise up and forgive. Dr. Paul Turnier wrote a little book called The Doctor's Case Book in the Light of the Bible. And in that book, he tells a story about one of his patients who had anemia. He had done the test there in his office, and he prescribed medicine, vitamins, and a regimen of diet and exercise. Well, the woman had, had stuck with that regimen, but she didn't get better. Instead, she got worse. One day, she was in his office, and he began to look at the results that he could do there in his office, and he told the woman, said, we need to schedule you for a couple of days in the hospital. They scheduled the date in the hospital and said that there he would be able to run a, a further battery of tests on this woman. The day that she came into the hospital, the hospital took the blood, ran the tests, and Dr. Turnier was looking at the results, and he didn't understand them at all. He, he was certain something must have gone wrong in the tests, so he had the tests run again. And it was there in, in those tests that he saw something that he didn't expect at all. He went to the woman's room, and he said, asked her, is there anything that changed between the time that we set the appointment and the time that you came into the hospital? She said, oh, yes, quite a bit. He said, tell me about it. She said, when you told me that I needed to be in the hospital a couple of days because my anemia wasn't getting any better, she said, I became afraid that once I checked into the hospital, I would never get out. And that's when she said, I, I felt like I, I needed to, to get my affairs in order. There was a person that had hurt me and and hurt me deeply. She said that 
I had been nurturing that hurt. I had been nursing that pain, and I'd been going over it again and again and again, and I hadn't forgiven that person, and never would I forgive that person. Then she said, if I wasn't ever going to get out of the hospital, I wanted to make sure and make my peace with that person. She said she called, and, and they were reconciled. The woman went on to say, for the first time in a long time, I felt like I could live again. Well, that's what unforgiveness does. It sucks the life right out of us. That's what unforgiveness does. It sucks and kills. It destroys all, all that's within us. That on the cross, what Jesus did for you and for me, He didn't wait till we were good enough. He didn't wait till we were better than we had been. He didn't wait till like Bartimaeus that we cried out. He didn't wait until we called out like the lepers. He didn't wait till we tugged like the woman that he forgave us. Well, we're still a long way off. That Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before we cried out, before we called out, before we tugged, you and I were forgiven. Now, most often we don't receive that forgiveness until we cry out, until we call out, until we tug. But the compassion of God through Jesus Christ is shown there on the cross for you and for me in His forgiveness. And and to forgive others before they ask? To forgive someone before they, they know that they've done any wrong to us, before they recognize that they've hurt us, well, that's not natural at all. We can't do that. We don't have the power. But the risen Christ does. And when He rose from the grave, He gave that power to you and to me to forgive. To forgive the same way that that He forgave on the cross. To forgive, not just when someone's sorry enough, not just when someone's met our expectation and our threshold of being truly repentant, but even before. To forgive means to to separate, to separate as far as the east is from the west. That you and I have been given power power that comes only from the risen Christ. Power to forgive. So rise up. Rise up. Hear the hope. Rise up and forgive. Rise up and trust Him. And the third thing that I wanted to talk about this morning is to rise up and follow. Christopher was a nine-year-old boy. And he had moved much more often than, than most nine-year-olds ever do. He had moved from the orphanage into the foster home, and then from the foster home back to the orphanage, and then from the orphanage back to another foster home, and then back to the orphanage again, again and again and again and again, until he was nine years old, and then he was adopted by a loving mother and father, And he had three loving sisters, Jana, Geraldine, and Johanna. Well, things went very well for for Christopher until he did what nine-year-olds often do. He blew it. He made a mistake. He accidentally left the door open, and he let the dog out. Well, then he began to cry. His parents tried to console him, but he wouldn't be consoled. And then he said it. He said the words. He said, please don't send me back. Well, they tried to console him. They said, Christopher, we would never send you back. You're a part of the family. You're one of us. And so that made a difference for a while until Christopher did what nine-year-olds often do. He blew it. He made a mistake. There at dinner, he accidentally knocked over his glass. He began to cry. And his mother and father began to console him 
And that's when he said it again. He said, please don't send me back. Whatever you do, don't send me back. Well, they were shocked. There was nothing in them that, that, that suggested that they might send him back. And they said, Christopher, we would never send you back. You're a part of the family. Well, that helped out for a while. But then Christopher did it again. He did what nine-year-olds often do. He messed up. He blew it. The, he tracked in mud from outside. And when he looked back and he saw what he had done, he began to cry. When his mother and father asked him what was wrong, he said that he was sorry that he didn't mean to do it. And he began to cry as, as if they would never forgive what he had done. And, and they tried to console him. And that's when he said it again. He said, please don't send me back. Whatever you do, please don't send me back. His mother and father said, you're a part of the family. Never would we send you back. And that's when his father called a meeting. They said, Christopher, I've decided to call a meeting of the family. And this day, I want you to choose your name. Well, without hesitating, Christopher said, I want my name to be Jay. My sisters are Jana, Johanna, and Geraldine. I want my name to begin with Jay. I want you to call me Jay. From that day, they called him Jay. And this is what Christopher said. He says, at that point, I was able to fit in. At that point, he said, his life was changed forever. You and I, as Christians, we've, we've chosen a name. A name that indicates that, that we follow Jesus Christ. But it may be that, that you've done what nine-year-olds often do, that you blew it. Or maybe you do what you've done what 16-year-olds often do, that you lost your nerve. Or maybe you did what 39-year-olds often do, you lost your way. Or maybe you do what 60-year-olds often do. You just messed up. You just messed up royally. And you're off the road, that you're not following, and that, that your life right now feels like it's in the ditch. Know that when you chose that name, follower, when you chose that name, Christian, when you did what, what Scripture calls us to do. And in Romans 10, verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's not that you might be saved or you ought to be saved or you could be saved or there's a good shot at you being saved. No, you shall be saved. It means you shall be rescued. That your life is forever changed. That your name, that his name is, well, it's your name. Christian. Christian. And that if, if you're off the road right now, he has power. You and I don't have power to rise up and to follow. Or it may be that this morning that you've never confessed with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And that word Lord means that you, you follow him. And that you... You didn't believe in your heart. You might have believed with your head, but believing with your heart means that you lean on, on Him, you rely on Him, that you trust Him. You trust that God raised Him from the dead to live His life through you. And that you've never done that before. Well, I, I want to invite you to do that this morning, and I want to pray with you. Let's pray. Jesus, now more than ever, we need strength we don't have. The strength, your strength, the strength of the risen Christ, your Holy Spirit living through us this day. And it seems like a simple thing, but there may be people that, that haven't done it this morning, confess with their mouth that Jesus, you are the Lord. You are the leader of their lives. Lord, confess this day you are Lord and it may be that there are folks that maybe they confess that, that, that you're the leader but they didn't believe with their heart they didn't trust 
that God raised you from the dead. That you're to, you, you made your home within us. And you give us power we don't have. Power that we might trust. Power that we might forgive. Power that we might rise up and follow you. May the power of the risen Christ rise up in us. Not one day, but this day. And Lord, will you use us that word of you might spread. Spread throughout, well, spread throughout our home. Spread throughout our, our neighborhood, our community, our town, and our world. Because Jesus, our greatest need, our greatest need, it's you. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.